Very good morning, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the first session. Uh, I'm Ray Bug, founder of Digit. I'm just going to be hosting this, this hour-long session um, on stream two in our breakouts. Um, if you have any questions over the course of these sessions, you can actually drop those into the comments box um, within the platform. Uh, and we'll be happy to, to put those to the speakers if we have time. If we don't have time, then obviously you can go to the exhibition stands and have a chat with the team direct. If while watching you can't read the slides, just double click on the video. That will actually bring you to full screen or there is the expander button at the bottom right hand corner. Um, our first speaker is Scott Brisbane from OneTrust. Scott is the offerings manager there and he's going to be talking today uh, with us about getting behind risk quantification. So Scott, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll hand the floor over to yourself. And as I say to, to everybody who's watching now, if you have got any questions, please drop them in comments. That's great. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. So um, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different today. Um, we are, I, I know we build three tips for, for risk insights, um, but I'm going to actually give you five. But to get to that end point of our journey, um, I'm going to take you on a look at a different aspect around risk of quantification. Half an hour is not long enough to talk about something like FAIR or, or you know, looking at quantitative and qualitative aspects of risk. But there are things that we can consider along that path of the journey. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. For the next 30 minutes, I'm Scott Bridgen. Um, I run our GRC function, spent many years in uh, cybersecurity um, and risk management for the intelligence and security services, um, and then in Vendorland. So I've sat on both sides of the fence. I think I prefer Vendorland, if the truth be told. Um, and so pre-pandemic picture, by the way, with this beard. Right. Welcome to class. Now, even though since the dawn of man, risk management is a concept that has existed I like the Chinese interpretation of risk management because it looks at both danger and opportunity. And interestingly, that opportunity aspect is something that we don't always necessarily consider in the world of cyber and IT risk management. We very much are focused on danger. And that's a number of reasons because we are protecting and securing invariably the data that sits or resides or transmitted or moves between the storage or containers that effectively we have to look after. But the opportunity aspect is something that the business is looking at consistently. They have objectives. They are going out doing their day-to-day -day stuff. That day-to-day -day stuff is something that we can actually help them with. And that's obvious. But when it comes to reporting up, this concept often only focuses on danger and not value. Now, I'm not here to say that risk can become a positive cost center of your organization. That is something that definitely can occur, but with a level of maturity and a level of process that a lot of organizations don't have today. However, at the heart and the essence of risk, we take and manage risks to achieve objectives. Pretty straightforward. The objectives thing, though, unless you're in the world of enterprise risk or you have a more mature cyber and IT risk management program, it is unlikely that you are directly linking it to objectives. You have them in sight and you could probably reel them off to someone in the event of having to have a conversation. But those board presentations that we have to put together quite often we have to translate. And it's not necessarily technical information, it's risk information, because we want to make it as impactful as possible so we can achieve our own objectives, whether that's getting more resource, drawing attention to something, or showing people an event that could occur down the road. And so we use time, and time is used across everything that we do. We look at the past to inform decisions. We have today the things that we absolutely have to do and the action that we expect people to take, but we use today to then look at the future. However, when we come to then relate that back to risk management, quite often what happens is, is we use time in a slightly odd way. 
Now, when I say slightly odd, I mean, it's something that makes sense to us. Direction, velocity, risk is something that is a concept humans we understand. But we've all been in a situation where we've had to describe uh, a risk or a situation or a scenario or even a threat to someone outside of our domain. And that explanation takes a little bit longer than we expected. So why then do we use reporting that we understand, but when we then have to report up, we have to translate. And so let's talk about danger and our Chinese friends. We are pre-programmed for the speed of decision making. If we look at the humble traffic light, this is something that helps us very quickly with the highly familiar rag status that we all know, maybe love, the red, amber, green. Red, bad, green, good, yellow, maybe I can cross, maybe I can make it, who knows. What happens is, is your brain is making millions of decisions, or hundreds of thousands of decisions probably at that point, um, and What's occurring is you are defining appetites and tolerances, you're applying mitigating measures and controls, or even the intention of doing something. Therefore, to keep traffic flowing, and because we are lucky enough to have these brains that can do this, this speed of decision making is absolutely essential. If we didn't have it, we all know what happens when traffic lights fail. It comes to a halt at a junction or a roundabout because people are not quite sure whether they can go and it becomes a bit of a free for all. So the minute the stabilizers are off, that decision making process gets slowed down. Again, we often think, well, it works for other things in life. Let's incorporate it into risk. Now, I'm not saying that red, amber, green is bad for risk management because it does allow you to very quickly identify good and bad. But it's not the whole picture, is it? Because our brain is making those decisions, we are effectively, that context resides within. I don't have to verbalise it every time I'm taking an action, although if you've seen me drive, I will very often verbalise what the other drivers are doing not necessarily in the nicest of ways. However, this is something that should be familiar to everyone, the heat map. Now we're not here necessarily to talk about whether or not heat maps are good or bad. I have very strong opinions on this, more than happy to share offline. But what you tend to find is with our heat map is that we go with the same methodology. Red is bad and green is good. Anyone that's had the opportunity to watch uh, Deshaun's webinar from Netflix about risk quantification from last year. It's something definitely worth watching. Um, he makes some very good book recommendations around measuring risk. Um, I used an element of this from an inspiration perspective, but I want to dive into something a little bit deeper because when we're talking about heat maps, even with a very complex or mature matrices that sits underneath it, it's not the whole picture because what happens is over time, we build up this report and we have all of these problems and a risk becomes. It's deliberately blurry, by the way. And it's blurry because it's the situation that if you put that in front of someone that doesn't understand risk management, it is completely meaningless. Or they're going to have to try and attempt to work it out from some, you know, at some point. Now, that's not a bad thing for us necessarily, because those that understand this kind of data, we can interpret it very quickly. But it isn't just about us. There are the, fir the first line or the lines of business, risk and control owners. Um, we are often custodians or guardians at certain points. We obviously do own risk, but we have to report on it. But there's the other thing. It's reporting up. Those upstairs expect data in a different language and in something that's very quick and easy to consume. If you present something like this, you deserve all of the questions you're going to invariably get. And so what's missing 
from that data? What's the secret source? It's quite simple, actually. In the empty white space, it's context. A little bit of math, but we're not here to talk about that necessarily today. I'm going to touch on it later. We take and manage risk to achieve objectives. The previous slide does not give me any of that context. What were the objectives that we're trying to the business was trying to achieve? It might tell me a risk, it might tell me a scenario, it might give me some element of data. But it's compartments that I then have to roll up. Risk quantification is something that is a bit of a flavor of the month at the moment. I don't know what's happened or what drove or caused that. Maybe it's the academic aspect of people spending time researching during the pandemic. But it definitely seems to be trending on LinkedIn. Risk quantification isn't just about applying math. It is also about aligning it against objectives properly. There's lots of advice and guidance around the math part because math is a process. And wonderfully, it makes it very easy for us, once you've got the hang of it, to be able to use our data in an efficient manner. Now, I am a mathematician. I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to this kind of thing. And you know, you wouldn't look at it to believe me apart from the beard. But um, what I tend to find is when speaking with customers, and certainly CISOs, IT risk managers, controls assurance or program managers, is that that tying back to objectives is the bit that they spend the most time on. But there's another problem is that if I'm giving ownership of risk to someone else or I am taking that risk and I'm reporting it up, there's a human factor that I've got to do deal with. Now, there's a very interesting set of data coming out about anthropology and cybersecurity. Um, at the heart of it, it's something that fascinates me. Um, but in risk management, it's actually something that can really cause us problems. Because if we look at what 2020 threw at us, just alone, take out all of the day-to-day -day stuff. Now, this isn't even everything. There are some things on here I couldn't include because it goes off into a slightly uncomfortable conversation area, depending on where you live or sway politically. But 2020 was pretty weird. The conversation around resilience beyond BCM and disaster recovery, it's no longer about RTOs and RPOs. The board is asking when faced with uncertainty, what actually is the true impact of our inability to operate? And funny enough, a lot of that sits with us. The person that coined the phrase digital transformation was very clever. However, I feel like it's overused because we're not really transforming anymore. Transforming means we're gonna become something else. There's like an end goal. It's a transformation. It will finish or stop. It's actually evolution at this point. We are in digital evolution. We are becoming something better and adapting to our surroundings and environment and the outside threats that could prevent us from achieving our objectives. So in the world of digital evolution, resilience is king and context becomes so important. We've got the expanding attack surface. I'm not here to talk about Moat and Castle versus Zero Trust and how we protect and secure all of that. There are much more talented people that you've either heard from or going to hear from during the course of these sessions. But it's a big thing. The emerging risk aspect, privacy compliance, our colleagues in privacy, or maybe we look after it. Maturing security standards, the ever-changing. If I want to do business now with the US Department of Defense, no longer is DFARS in place. Well, it is for the time being. Um, and is it voluntary or honorary based? I now have to go through a CMMC process and get audited by someone that sounds like there's something from Star Wars, the C3PAO. No Disney lawyers on here, I hope. Plus, we've got 5G, AI, the Internet of Everything, all flavors of the month as well. And lastly, the extended enterprise. The extended enterprise is something that's become critical during the course of the pandemic. The look uh, or the looking glass that we have to sort of almost gaze into is not just about our immediate relationships. It is the fourth parties, the fifth parties, because the pandemic caused a lot of issues. And we had to make a choice around third party risk or third party trust, because 
in the short period of time that we had to adjust, there was an element of trust that we had to apply. Now, that's a positive thing. I don't think it should ever be called 30 party risk anyway, because that starts the conversation on a negative tone. Really, it should be around third party trust. And with a good program in place, with a good set of criterion, you can actually and the amazing sets and sources of data that we have available to us these days that can tell us or give us insights on our third parties, we can actually very quickly identify elements of trust and build a register of trust on our vendors and then look at the riskier ones in a slightly different way. And we can also then align that to objectives, appetites and tolerances. I haven't missed one. I've deliberately chosen not to mention them. The unaware employee. The unaware employee is one of our biggest adversaries. I'm not here to talk about threat actors in the traditional sense. I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick that unaware employee because they serve two areas. They are a user of the services that we provide and they are someone that we work alongside in a very traditional business sense. But when it comes to risk management, we have another factor. Your pandemic line of business are your most valuable and your most variable assets. When we're talking about risk ownership or control ownership and responsibilities, traditionally, they were very difficult. We've all had issues trying to communicate with them over the years, whether it's to inspire them about cybersecurity, passwords are like underwear back in the day, through to the modern ways that we approach communicating with them. However, the pandemic, and I'm not going to labour the point on this because we all know what this is about, and I'm not even going to talk about new normals, but we are overworking. My commute is no longer from Bath to London. It's stepping over the dog, dodging the kids, kissing them goodbye with a cup mug of coffee, take a pew, and I am starting earlier and I'm finishing later. On top of all of that, we have an elements of fatigue. We have already stressful jobs. The pandemic made that a little bit more stressful, but a lot of businesses actually went into employee reduction and people were made redundant or furloughed. Resources were constrained from that perspective. Deadlines were increased and a lot of us had to stand up systems or make sure elements of security policy and other aspects were in place to allow us to continue to operate effectively. We had to make decisions about shadow IT and our appetites and tolerances around that, which I'm sure a lot of people had already, but aspects of that probably had to change. Now, shadow IT, is a necessary evil. It can allow for innovation and it can be very much a good thing. Obviously, it can be a bad thing if the wrong people are implementing it with the wrong protections that we expect that meet and match our policy that we want. But fatigue is something to think about and something to remember. The last thing is dealing with uncertainty. Uncertainty comes in two areas. I have an inward reflection of my life, my home, what's happening in the world. That is something to me that's personal and the factors that sit outside of that. That is quite important. But there's another piece, which is the external piece, which is actually the organization, the tone from the top, the communication, the responsibility us as security leaders. Uh, and certainly when we're talking about risk management to make sure that levels of uncertainty are reduced in through clear communication. We often ask the business what they expect of us. It's a conversation that we have. Mr. or Mrs. Person in HR, you have this data. How do you use it? What do you want from me? How available does it need to be? Does it need to be wrapped up in cotton wool? How safe and secure must it be? Where does it get transferred? Who's using it? Blah, 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 blah. Uncertainty is something that causes problems when we're talking not just about standard cybersecurity, but risk management. And then lastly, working from home. It's easy for some, difficult for others. Not here to talk about that, but it isn't good for everyone. On top of all of this, we have, thank you, Wikipedia, the cognitive bias, the factors and risk perceptions, all the different aspects that people actually have to consider when we actually even just talk about risk management. Ever seen this in a framework? Not in any risk management framework that I've seen where we're actually taking into account the audience or the type of people that are actually applying it. Do you know why? It's because you can't really apply math or mathematics. Sorry, I keep saying math. Maths to this kind of stuff. But this plays a huge part. However, when we talk about things like probability 
a magnitude. They are measurable things. There are metrics associated with it. And it's the reason why things like FAIR, which isn't necessarily for everyone, and I'm not here to bleat on about FAIR, because it definitely isn't for everyone. But what, sorry, what happens is, is these affect the way that risk is measured. And because there is a natural probability bias innate in all of us, and we could be put into one of these four buckets. We're optimists, pessimists, polarized, i.e. if it's amazingly good, it's good. If it's bad, it's the absolute worst. And vagueness, the fence sitters. Now, there'll be crossover and I'm sure bleed between these and it will depend on different time of day and actually going back to our cognitive biases as well will probably affect how some of this other probability piece works. But again, when we talk about risk management, how do we account for this? Well, we can talk about a five steps example. Now, this isn't um, me trying to get you guys to all go and for the full maximum risk quantification, looking at both quantitative and qualitative aspects. Hopefully what I'm going to explain will give you some insight into some approaches that customers that we've worked with um, and conversations that I've had with CISOs across the world in all different industries and sectors. So I'm in a very fortuitous position. I'm in a bit of an ivory tower because I've been out of domain for a long time. I'm an old man. And um, when you leave the domain and go into vendor land, you get this luxurious position because quite often it, we come across as a bit preachy because we want you to buy our products and our marketing teams will run through what's flavor of the month, what's trending. And we obviously try and push that. Now that's good because it gives you obviously exposure to the kind of new innovations and thing that's happening. But the five steps example is practical things that your peers have told me. And so whether you're beginning a journey whether you want to mature your journey or whether you're already super mature, you're just looking for different ways or maybe additional things that you can put into your quiver. Hopefully this will help. So where do we begin? Seeing as we've been talking about objectives, surely that's a good place to start. Actually, no. One of the best places to start is looking at actually scenarios, threats, opportunity if that is something that potentially comes into it, loss event magnitude. But the scenario pieces are critical. Who's who in the jungle? Where do we fit in? The expected responsibilities and associated risks that we have or other people have on our behalf through risk ownership, whether that's to individuals or shared. We need to understand the scenarios properly. So actually it really helps not just looking at threat scenarios, threat and risk is often very, very, they're mistaken for each other um, because they are very, very closely aligned. Um, however, the amount of people that describe threats to me as opposed to the actual risk, um, if I had a, a pound, this would be a TED talk, I'd be on a private island and this would be very different. I don't think you wanna see me in a, a beach shirt and Hawaiians though, anyway. So identifying scope is absolutely critical and it's actually not as much effort. It can be done through assessment capability. It can be done through initial sort of workshopping. And it's something that you can do over time. It doesn't have to be done all at once. The critical and the priorities you kind of will already know based on some of the conversations that you're having or have already had. You have a program in place already. So the beginning of your journey doesn't necessarily mean starting from zero. The other thing that you can do if you want, and I would recommend it, but it isn't for everyone, is not guessing. If you can't get into uncertainty modeling or simulation and go the full whack, then do you know what? Start with something nice and simple like decision tree analysis or utilize decision tree analysis to get you on the beginnings of that journey. It can be done very straightforward in a spreadsheet. You don't need a GRC tool to do it, believe it or not. Salespeople, close your ears if anyone from my team are on here. And it can be done in a very, very straightforward way. And it will give you the ability, actually uncertainty modeling actually will help in the absence of data. So if your excuse is, well, I don't have enough data or good quality data, then actually that's the perfect candidate for uncertainty modeling in the first place. But then you turn around and say, well, I'm not a data scientist or a mathematician. And you know what? That's fine. You can 
very easily, 10 minutes on YouTube, bit of a spreadsheet, you can start to do it. Work in the language of the business. This is something that I think the modern CISO and modern security teams actually understand now. Um, they're no longer technologists, they're evangelists for the business and business partners. So, however, when we're talking about rolling up risk, if we don't understand what the language of the business is, um, we don't know what their objectives are, which we'll touch on in just a moment, then we can get lost. Or more importantly, they can get lost when we come to translate and report this up. Because even loss event and magnitude is very much tying it to an impact and likelihood. Loss is great, but it isn't the complete picture. Because what I have to then do is I have to align it to objectives. I have to make it contextual from that perspective and give people the ability to be able to properly understand the impact of risk. That 30 second conversation, whether it's in an elevator or you're walking down a corridor, when we can eventually walk down corridors with our colleagues again. How compliant are we? How safe are we? How secure are we? Those ridiculous questions that get asked, but if you think about it, they're actually quite reasonable. If I'm leading an organization, if I am effectively the figurehead or spearhead of an entire organization, I want some very simple and quick answers. And those questions are quite natural for me to ask. So in that 30 second period, if I don't have that data, if I, if I don't know what the objectives are of the person that I'm talking to and the direction of the business, short, medium and long term goals, I'm going to tell them what are the biggest risks to the business. And I'll just give them a generic circle. Don't get me wrong, it could be the most important thing. You might strike it lucky and that might be the thing that matters. Or if you actually, on the flip side of this, you need your own set of resources, you need additional investment, you want to make sure or make get processes change through you know, the traditional sort of cross-functional aspects that you'd expect. If you can't translate it, it doesn't go back to objectives or something that's meaningful, it becomes really difficult. So you can get objectives from the business. Enterprise risk team have been doing it for years. What's my, they work in obviously the strategic, you know, the horizon, so the long term and probably now more so the medium term given the pandemic. But there is a level of expertise around this. And this is something that enterprise security risk, I've seen it a lot mentioned. One thing I haven't seen is people trying to tie it back to those critical objectives. They're looking at the horizon stuff, thematic direction of the organization, but not the short and medium term goals. For example, goals would be, you know, company needs to make IR, ARR or revenue, deliver widgets, customer satisfaction services. We're launching a new initiative. We're going into a new country or we want to do something over the course of a period, whatever that measurable period is. How do I, within the security and cyber team, how do I explain the risks that are posed for that initiative. The importance of this is critical, I feel, as time goes on and as more is expected of us and as we become a continued trusted partner and we no longer have to fight for time at the board level. Well, we can quantify that and more importantly, justify it if we are aligning to objectives. And then the last piece is change is okay. A lot of people don't like changing risk management process because they worry that the legacy data or the way they've measured risk previously, because of the nature of it, especially when audit are involved, um, it can affect things. So therefore they become resistant to change, which is slightly ironic considering cyber and security and, and even IT are probably the most uh, embracing of change because we have to, because the pace of change is so significant. So why then do we make it more difficult for ourselves by sticking to something that we like or love from a risk management perspective and keeping it? You are what you measure. And as we come into the final couple of minutes of this, whilst it's good to have, sorry, whilst it's key to have good data in the long term, which you must be able to relate back to your objectives, having poor and incomplete data isn't an excuse to adopt something new and exciting like quantitative risk modeling. In fact, it is one of the best reasons to adopt uncertainty. Now, that isn't necessarily something you have to do. You don't always need a big data set and going forward, you shouldn't 
collect data if you can only relate it to risks and you can't tie it to objectives. But it's OK to start now. And lastly, in an unbiased way, collect and record the appropriate data, which you can make assumptions with from that perspective. Uh, and therefore, you can actually work out how to reduce the uncertainty with meeting your objectives, your colleagues objectives and the business objectives. Back to our Chinese colleagues, danger and opportunity. And we take a managed risk to achieve objectives. Let's make sure we are tying and linking them to objectives. One final piece before I leave you. There are two people on LinkedIn that I follow that I find particularly fascinating at this. Um, I gain a lot of inspiration from. Um, I would strongly recommend that you follow them on LinkedIn. Um, Graham, mathematician, um, awesome. Quite controversial thoughts, same with Hernan. Um, I'm not in no way linked to them, neither is one trust, by the way, they're not partners or relationships of ours. Um, they're just two people that I always feel like, you've just listened to me talk, where do I get this stuff from there and obviously the other stuff that I have. Anyway, I would like to thank you very much for your time. We have about seven seconds. So if you have any questions, please come to the stand, find me on LinkedIn, reach out and we'll go from there. Thanks very much. God, thank you very, very much. Uh, hugely interesting presentation. Somebody yeah, had actually asked on, on our link um, who the Netflix presentation was, but another one of our guests who are watching has actually answered the question, uh, which is the risk quantification presentation by Netflix and has already put the link in there for us. So I haven't got to bother you with that one. So thank you very much indeed. Folks, if you have got any questions for um, Scott or the team, please head over to the OneTrust stand, go into the open chat, then they'll spin up private chat and answer any questions that you have. But Scott, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, we're now going to introduce Georgia Bell from Dark Trace. Dark Trace, as you well know, uh, if you're an F1 fan like me, you see them all over. Is it the McLaren car that they're they're currently adorning, uh, Georgia? You need to unmute your mic because I can't do it from my side. Yep, there you go. How's there you that? are. There you are. There you are. You're in the room. Is it, is it McLaren there? Okay. You're, you're, do you, do you get tickets for F1, by the way? Is that is that a fringe benefit? Within oh, the I wish. I wish. Um, yeah, if anyone's been watching any Drive to Survive on Netflix at the moment, you might well have spotted us on the on the back of the McLaren car. Um, uh, and, we were indeed. there last year and we'll be here again. I think season is kicking off this weekend, actually. So I have, I have um, already yeah, binge-watched the entire season. <laughs> Um, and hence the reason the question came along. Um, Dark Trace, you're no stranger to, to Digit events. I think this is the 10th or the 12th event you've done with us over the past few years, and it's great to have you back. You're going to be talking today, George, about the changing power of AI in cyber attacks. So I'm just going to spin up your slides and I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Same thing with Georgia. If you have got any questions, you can either punch them through the, the comments box on the uh, screen of the platform or alternatively go and visit the uh, the uh, Dark Trace team on their exhibition stand. Georgia, over to you. Perfect. Thanks very much, Ray. Uh, and thanks, everyone. Good morning. I hope you're having a good event. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about Darktrace if you haven't heard of us already. I'm obviously biased, but I think it's one of the most interesting topics at the moment, talking about how the cyber landscape is changing and specifically the rise in offensive AI and how you need that defensive AI to be able to give human teams a fighting chance to keep up with the changing pace of cyber threats today. And so what I'll do is tell you a little bit about Darktrace as a company, the products that we're using and how we're adapting to the changing battlefield when it comes to cybersecurity. And hopefully if any of this sounds interesting, if it sounds like there might be an opportunity for you to explore Dark Trace within your own company, then we have our booth. So please feel free to come over after the session today and ask us any questions and we'll see if it could potentially work for you as well. Um, but if you have seen anything about Dark Trace, you'll have likely seen this DNA strand. It's a really good way to understand the technology um, but before I get into the product, let me just tell you a little bit more about Darktrace as an organisation. So we were set up back in 2013 by mathematicians based out of the University of Cambridge and were the first to come to market with this idea of a self-learning AI platform for cyber defence. They didn't really know how it was going to go. And here we are, flash forward to eight years later, and Darktrace is the fastest growing cybersecurity company as named by the Financial Times last year. We haven't been around for as long as some other companies out there when it comes to cybersecurity, 
but in terms of our employee count and the customer adoption that we've had, so over 4,500 customers across 110 different countries globally in every single industry, obviously shows that the technology is doing something right. And that really comes down to the big research and development team that we have based in Cambridge. We've got over 30 PhDs based in mathematics and machine work learning that are constantly working to develop the tool. So that means making sure it's able to respond autonomously. We were the creators of autonomous response on the market three years ago, and also being able to deploy into all environments, even if they're cloud native. So anything like SaaS, Teams, Microsoft, Darktrace is able to deploy across the entire digital estate. So before we jump in and start talking a bit more about Darktrace's capabilities as a technology, I just want to focus on looking at what's changed over the past year when it comes to the cyber landscape. So it's undeniable that what happened in 2020 has rapidly expanded the attack surface when we think about all of those users that are now working from home. They're no longer on the corporate Wi-Fi, no longer on the corporate security. If they're off the VPN, there's a blind spot for organizations. And of course, rapid spin ups of things like cloud environments, SaaS environments, where perhaps security is an afterthought. And so the dynamic workforce is certainly a concern for all of the IT teams that we speak with now and in the future. The second trend that we saw is pretty depressing when we see the kinds of things that are being targeted. So critical infrastructure, medical centers, research facilities trying to come up with a vaccine education facilities moving online. There seems to be a real increase in the physical impact of cyber attacks. Last year, we actually saw the first death from a ransomware attack where someone was rushed to a hospital in Germany and because of a ransomware attack, they weren't able to be treated within that hospital, were redirected to another hospital and on the journey died. So this is not just having an impact on data, it's actually having an impact on human lives. Thirdly, the rise in nation state attacks. It completely makes sense if you are up against another country and want to have an impact on them that you would target their water, their energy, their critical services. I think Boris Johnson in the news this week mentioned that that uh, the UK needs to do more to boost its ability to carry out cyber attacks because cyber is changing the way that we do warfare now, the way that power and energy did 100 years ago. And then finally, what's changing in AI powered attacks. So machine learning and AI powered attacks are definitely here to stay. And what we're gonna see is that traditional security tools that rely on previously seen attacks or predicting what's gonna happen in the future, they're just gonna be out of pace because these attacks are becoming more sophisticated and more difficult to detect. So what does offensive AI actually mean? So this is kind of the new wave when it comes to cybersecurity of what we're gonna see in attacks. So these are gonna be attacks that are so subtle, they virtually blend into the environment. They understand the organization and so can multiply at pace and speed to have really drastic impacts. And we've already started to see that in some way with some of the ransomware attacks that are taking place, but it's only gonna get more and more extreme. So I'm not here to tell you about what your cybersecurity concerns are. Of course, you guys are gonna know that much better than I am, but just across our customer base and the customers that we work with and insights from the industry as a whole, there are a few trends that seem to continually come up. And if we look at this slide, 83% of cybersecurity professionals believe that AI augmentation is necessary for cyber defense today. If you are someone five, 10 years ago, whether they would rely on a machine to make a decision about um, how to contain a threat in the business, it's very unlikely that they would say, yep, yeah, I'm happy to do that. But now it's seen as a necessity because of the sheer pace and speed of threats that we're seeing across customer networks on a daily basis. And so to give teams a fighting chance, they need to bring on AI as a security solution. And so, Let's take a look at the ways that security attacks are changing. So this is an example of a spoofing attack from the past. And this will probably look very dodgy to uh, a lot of people that are on the call today. I think 
with all the phishing and security training that we get, it's pretty obvious to spot that this is not a legitimate uh, a legitimate email. So there are a few things that are quite clear about this. I mean, the fact that there is a spelling mistake in incredible is probably a giveaway. The fact that the email doesn't match the email address, the email name. There's not been a lot of effort that's gone into this. This is what previous attacks look like. And so users should hopefully be able to spot that this is clearly spam. If we jump towards what's happening today, spoofing attacks and email attacks are getting much better. People have the power of social media to be able to go and look at the person's profile, understand how they behave, recent events they've been at, and create conversations that are based on real life incidents, which means the user is much more likely to open that email. So this is a much better spoofing attempt. This is coming from Dan Fine, who's our director of email security. We can see that at least Dan Fine is in the email address, but we're darktrace.com, not antigena.com. So that's the first giveaway. And if you didn't spot it, then obviously a link that says HTTP fake URL is probably not something you're gonna click on. And then finally, of course, the fact that Dan's being so nice, that's pretty inconsistent with Dan. If you knew him, that was probably the giveaway to say this isn't legitimate. So it's more likely that those inconsistencies in the language are much more difficult to pick up. And you can only do that with some kind of AI solution. Finally, looking to the future, it's very likely that cyber attacks are gonna be using AI to perfectly replicate tone, language style, after getting an insight into the network and seeing how users behave. This is the kind of attacks that we'll be seeing in the future. Very targeted, very precise, incredibly difficult for IT teams and users to detect when something looks unusual. It's not the traditional previously seen attacks that we saw in recent examples, the future is gonna be much trickier for users to make the decision on their own about what looks unusual and also for businesses to defend that on a global scale. So where does Darktrace actually come into this? So if you have heard of Darktrace before, you'll know that we base all of our understanding of our body's own approach to dealing with attacks. So building a cyber immune system for the business to understand an organization's DNA and then detect anomalies. So the idea is that we're not relying on rules and signatures. We're not training data to catch previously seen threats. Instead, what Darktrace is doing is building up patterns of life for how users, devices, and the network as a whole behaves. And then it can detect, investigate, and respond to anomalies from there. So because of that approach of not relying on previously seen threats, that means the scope of things that we can tap detect is huge. So it can be anything from a misconfiguration, an outdated system, a user logging in from an unusual a location, a device that starts beaconing out to a rare external domain. Obviously anything like brand new malware, ransomware is going to look highly unusual. And the solution can be deployed across the entire digital estate. So what this means is that organizations can have one AI engine that's bringing context to every single incident to say whether that looks unusual or usual for the business. Now, here's what the platform today actually looks like. So that's a little bit about the concept, a little bit about the approach we've taken and how it's different to traditional security tools on the market. Now, this is what Darktrace's AI platform looks like and what's on offer today for customers to both test and of course purchase. So the idea is that Darktrace's immune system can be deployed in any of the digital pots that you require. So most organizations that we work with have some kind of hybrid environment where they're using email, of course. I'd be uh, amazed if there's any company today that use email, uh, that don't use email. Um, and so we have the email environment, the SaaS environment, we have client sensors to cover users when they're off the VPN, we cover public and private cloud, as well as all network, operational technology, and IoT and shadow IoT. So the idea is you can see your entire business in one pane of glass and have one AI engine that's making sense of everything and prioritizing alerts to you. 
once we have all of this information, what Starcher is actually doing with it, it is detecting, investigating and responding to threats at the speed and scale of AI to save time and money for human teams. So the enterprise immune system is the key detection piece. So that's the solution that is able to make sense of everything and then rank it based on all of the activity that we see about how unusual it is. So again, this can be something that perhaps is a low level down compliance issue all the way up to files being encrypted at machine speed, which looks like a live attack. Very closely linked to that is the cyber AI analyst. And what the cyber AI analyst is doing is taking all of the alerts that Darktrace presents as being unusual and replicating the role of a human analyst, but doing this at the speed and scale of AI. So Darktrace is the only product on the market that offers this AI-driven investigation and analysis for teams. It's able to run queries, correlate events, create reports at a click of a button to be able to put information in front of IT teams about the full scope of an incident so that they can just focus on the remediation side rather than spending hours trolling through logs, piecing it all together to work out the full scope of the threat. This reduces the time to triage for teams by about 92%. And then last but not least, is Dark Trace's antigena component. So I mentioned earlier the idea of relying on an autonomous system to take action in your network to contain a threat seemed quite revolutionary when Dark Trace was set up back in 2013. But very quickly, the speed of which we saw attacks happening meant that this was becoming increasingly relevant. So customers were saying, you know, that's great that Dark Trace can let me know in real time that I've got a ransomware attack. But what if I'm not in the office when that happens? Or what if I am in the office, but I can't respond as fast as the attack? And that's where Antigena comes in. So Antigena bases all of its understanding of the self-learning detection system of the immune system, and is therefore able to take targeted, precise responses to contain the threat at machine speed, while still allowing normal business operations to continue. So Antigena works across the network, cloud, SAS and email, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But what's unique about Antigena is that it's the only autonomous response on the market. So while a lot of other security tools do have the ability to take a response, it usually requires an automated playbook response, which requires a big engineering task for the team and goes back to the whole idea of having to predefine the threat first to be able to have a response. What Antigena does is it's intelligently able to make its own decision and take responses for human teams, even if they haven't come up with what the possibility of what the next threat looks like. Let's talk about Antigena a little bit more, because of course, in an age where we're seeing machine speed attacks, you need a machine speed response. So of course, Antigena is gonna be able to react faster than human teams. Out of our 4,500 customers, about 1,500 of them are using Antigena and many more are in the testing phase. How it works is you can have it in passive mode to see the kind of incidents it would take. So you can hypothetically build that understanding. Human confirmation mode, so it will send you an alert to say, Antigena wants to do this, do you approve or deny? And then finally is when you've built up that confidence, fully autonomous response mode, where it's able to take decisions on its own about how best to contain a threat at machine speed. This is very customizable. So customers can have it set to out of office hours, on the weekends, or they can have it for only parts of the network with certain devices. It's not, uh, it's not gonna give you limited options in terms of how you can implement it. And we would build it up in human confirmation node with you first, but a really powerful technology and given where the market is in terms of requiring an autonomous response to defend threats, Darktrace has been doing this in customer networks for over four years now. The more recent development with Antigena is Antigena in the email environment. So this is a product that has been around for just under two years now and is easily our fastest growing product. If you think about the fact that 90% of threats begin in the email environment, 90% of the attacks originate there. 
of course it makes sense to bring that AI solution of understanding what's normal and detecting anomalies into the email environment. Because while gateway tools are really good at stopping the known threats that have been seen before, stopping things that are already on a blacklist, they're really, they really struggle to catch things like hijacking. What happens if your CEO gets their credentials compromised and sends a message to 50 people within the organization, asking them to do something, asking them to click on a link, and it's coming from a legitimate sender? You need to be able to have an AI in place that's able to detect that that looks unusual and take a response from there. So what Antigena email does is it uses about 750 different metrics to build those patterns of life and understand what is normal for that user within the organization and their department and the organization as a whole. And then from there, it can take a proportionate response. So it does everything that you would expect a good email solution to do. So it can hold emails all together. It can lock links, it can convert attachments, all of those things that you would want from an email solution. But what's powerful about it is the decision-making process behind it about how it says this is unusual and how it comes to that decision. Now, I'm going to tell you a just story that we had with a, with a company. Um, there are various different stories that we can share, and I please invite everyone to come over to the booth afterwards and um, hear a little bit more about the organizations that we work with and what we found in their networks. But just one example that I think really highlights what happens within um, customer networks when we're seeing the rise of these AI driven attacks was an incident that we had with a telco company we were working with. So it was 7 p.m. on a Friday evening and one of the employees on his corporate work phone decided to go into his personal email, clicked on a link and it started to download a malicious attack. And what Darktrace saw was that this device started to communicate with an external server on the Tor network and started to deploy ransomware. So we could see, or Darktrace could see very early that this was incredibly fast moving. And after nine seconds after the start of the SMB encryption activities occurred, Darktrace raised an alert to say, this looks highly unusual. It doesn't look like normal activity. We need the IT team to look at this. But of course it was the weekend and people had gone home. And so because Darktrace is always constantly learning, constantly adapting to evolving probabilities, what it was able to then do was say, okay, we have enough context about this user and the network to say this kind of activity is not normal. This looks unusual. And so Antigena is gonna take a targeted machine speed autonomous response. And that happened within about 20 seconds of this event occurring on the network and was able to stop encryption of attempts from that device. So what that meant was the IT team, when they came back on the Monday morning, we were able to hold this event across the network. And so rather than them coming in and finding that all of their files have been encrypted and held for ransom, there was just the small amount of what had occurred in that 20 second period, which really goes to show that you can't rely on having humans that are always there and able to respond. You can't rely on coming up with all of the rules and signatures and possibilities of what an attack is gonna look like. The approach that companies have to take is deploying an AI onto the organization that's able to build that understanding and constantly adjust to changes and then take that targeted, precise, autonomous response to contain threats at machine speed, but still allow normal business operations to continue as usual. So hopefully that's been interesting to tell you a little bit more about Dark Chase as an organization. We'd love to share a bit more detail with you about it and also show you what it looks like in a live demonstration. So um, I think that I've actually wrapped up nice and early for you, Ray, which perhaps people are, if they've got rumbling stomachs, are looking forward to, to lunch. Um, but I don't know if there are any, com any questions that are on the chat. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer those now or speak to everyone at the booth. Georgia, thank you very, very much. Um, we'll let people go to the booths, I think is a good idea, because I think most people have got rumbling tummies. They haven't got far to go. And, and those that come to our physical events 
will know that um, there's normally a queue forming for the mushroom volivants and the little mini burgers that we do at Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh. We haven't got to worry too much about that. Uh, folks, thanks, uh, Georgia. Uh, lovely to see you and, and thank you for the great presentation. Um, I shall be re-watching uh, Drive to Survive. Um, I'm a, a mad F1 person and I'm going to be looking out for the Dark Trace uh, livery on the uh, on the McLaren car. Um, folks, if you have got any questions for Georgia or the wider Dark Trace team, uh, they are here for both days. You can go over there, organise demos. And more importantly, uh, I'll let you jump off now, Georgia, because you've probably got things to do as well. So thank you for coming and, uh, and thanks for your presentation. Um, Folks, just a quick reminder, um, over the course of lunch, if you do want to jump into the exhibition stand, we've got some pretty good prizes uh, for this event. We've got very generous vendors, £300 worth of John Lewis vouchers, um, a, a £50 bottle of whiskey. There's a driving experience or a spa day. There's 300 quid worth of Amazon vouchers. Don't forget, Digit are giving away £200 worth of Amazon vouchers for whoever wins the leaderboard as well. So you can get very competitive with each other. But I think we're back, um, I think, around one o'clock. Um, so we look forward to 1.30. So we look forward to seeing you then. We will be pinging your reminders through email. And don't forget, we have got a full day's uh, content tomorrow as well. So from myself uh, and the rest of the Digit team, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. <laughs>